Hello. Over the last couple of videos, we've become comfortable with the idea that every point on some function f of x, there is going to be an instantaneous rate of change that kind of represents the direction of that function at one point. And this can be represented with a tangent line. I'll draw here. Oops. Let's draw a nice kind of tangent line here. There's our tangent line representing the slope at that point. The slope of that tangent line is meant to be the instantaneous rate of change at that point that we've been talking about. And this point we're going to call, let's say, x1. It'll have the uh, y coordinate f of x1. And I'm going to call the instance, instantaneous rate of change there, or the slope there, I'm going to call that f prime of x1. Now, another thing that we've been learning about is something called the secant line. So the secant line is when you take two points. I'm going to take x1 here, and we'll call this x1, or no, let's call this x2. Yeah, so when we take two points, let's say x1 and x2, and we just find a line between them just like what you'd normally do with lines. You just take two points, you connect them. There we go, that's our secant line. And uh, what's the slope of this? First of all, we have f of x2 here. And uh, before we move forward, I want to simplify this a little further. Instead of using x2, why don't we use a little, uh, uh, some kind of variable that references x1. Like, let's do x1 plus some change in x, right? Some difference between these two points. That way we have f of, instead of this, we have, or that's, might as well clean this up nicely. Instead of having f of x2, Oops, we're gonna write f of x1 plus delta x, just so that we can get everything in terms of x1. All right, and uh, what's the slope here gonna be? I'm gonna call this m for one. Let's see if we can get that nice orange again. I'm gonna call that m. And we know what m is. For m, you just take m is going to be equal to, you take the, you know, y2 minus y1 over x2 over x1. So we take f of x1 plus delta x, that's our y2, minus f of x1, that's our y1, over, it's going to be x1 plus delta x minus x1, or just delta x. And this is the slope of our secant line. But when we're trying to find f prime of x, and that's ultimately our goal, and I gave a formula for, for it in the last video, but here I want to really explore how we can intuitively come up with that formula. When we have the secant line, we need to know what it really represents. So you're taking this total change of y over this total change of x. So if you multiply this by some difference in x, some change in x from one x, you'll find the total change in y Oh, you know, over that interval. That's what, that's the purpose of an average. Th this is an average slope, you can think of it, an average rate of change between these two points, right? This is a slope. This is going to be the average rate of change because if you multiply this rate of change of, you know, our y with respect to x, you will find some new y, regardless of the ups and downs of this function, right? All you need to do is, you know, this point and this secant line, and you can find this point. It doesn't matter if the curve goes up and down. So that's what an average does. But what an average also does, and another way that you can find an average, is by taking all of the little components and summing them up, and then dividing by the total number, right? So. If this is the average rate of change, 
uh, between this, you know, x1 and x1 plus delta x, that should also mean that that's the average of all of the, and I'm going to use red for this, all of the uh, instantaneous rates of changes along here, where we sum them all up. So all of these little points, there's an infinite number of them. We sum up all this infinite number of uh, slopes at each one of the infinite number of points, and we divide by how many they are, right? How would that make sense, right? Because we'd write, you know, what? We have f prime of x1, you know, plus, you know, dot, 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 all of the f primes until we get f prime of x plus delta x. And then we're dividing by like, I, this, you know, this is really sloppy, but we're essentially dividing by an infinite number. And we can't compute this. We can add up the infinity and divide by infinity yet, not with algebra at least, or um, our current understanding of maths. So what can we do for this? Because these really represent the same thing. But we want to find the essentially the slope at one point, so when there isn't any delta x. But here's when we uh, run into that you know, age-old issue. If we uh, set delta x equal to 0 up here to find the slope, we want this m. Right now, this represents between, you know, between two points. When we act like that point's the same, we want to find the slope at one point. We have f of x1, because this would be 0, and uh, minus f of x1, that's 0, divided by delta x, that would be 0. So we can't just say, oh, look, delta x is 0 here. But what we can kind of do is we can just narrow this down. So what we can do is we just take points closer and closer for the secant line so that we're kind of, you know, we're essentially having less f primes to work with in here. We're narrowing down. It's, you know, that's also kind of a fuzzy idea because, right, I mean, we'll have less f primes, but we already have an infinite, so this doesn't really help us algebraically, but we're getting closer, at least with uh, this method, to getting a more accurate representa representation of what this does as we get closer and closer and closer. So now what I'm going to do is draw a graph. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a little graph here. And this graph is going to represent our m. Let's do that m. Let's get that lovely m. And that's going to be with respect to whatever our delta x is. I should do that in red. And I'll do this uh, function in green as well. So when our delta x is reasonably low, right? We don't know what happens at 0 because we can't just plug 0 into this formula. This formula is essentially flawed, right? Because this formula accurately represents what this does, where you're summing up all of the um, instantaneous rates of changes between these you know, two uh, points with this interval, except the only issue is because of how it's constructed and our limitations, we can't just do it at one point. We can't plug in zero for delta x and find out what the slope is there for when delta x and there's no difference between the, um, the, you know, there's essentially an interval of zero. But what we can do is draw this on a graph. So what, what happens when delta x is a little bit larger? Like when delta x is way out here, you know, our slope is negative, it's a little low, right? But then as we get closer, it gets a little bit more negative, more negative, more negative, and then it gets, starts getting a little bit more positive. So we're going to have something like, we're going to have a slope that's getting more negative and more negative and more negative, and then it starts getting a little bit more positive. Well, here, that, I'm going to just draw this again. I don't know if this is what that graph would look like, but we don't know what happens at 0 because, right, we can't plug it in for 0. So I'm just going to do this circle here. Uh, and I'm going to, just so that we can see it easier, I'm going to color the center in black. So we don't really know what happens there because we can't just plug in 0 for this function, right? 
this would be uh, the function m of x, you can think of it as, I mean, not m of x, m of delta x. When delta x is 0, we can't just plug that in. We don't know what happens there. But remember, the reason that we don't know what happens when our interval is 0, when we're talking about one point, is because this formula is limited. That doesn't mean that the trend that this formula suggests is wrong. The, I mean, the only thing that we're missing is one point, right? Look, when we uh, go past here, you know, we, you know, we have points just, and you know, this will get positive, and whatever. We're, all we're missing is this one point. That's a little suspicious, don't you think? That, you know, the one we're looking for, look, we can kind of look at the graph and see where that would be, except it's not there, right? And what do we do when we have something like that? What's the thing that we were learning before we started getting into this? Limits. So what happens if we want to find essentially what this m of delta x, what our slope of the secant line, well, you know, secant line and kind of quotations would be if that delta x is equal to zero? Obviously, we can't plug it in, but we can look at the trend. As we get closer to that delta x being equal to zero, the slope gets closer and closer to this one value, as suggested by the trend. So pretend that this m is representing this. What this point is here that's missing is basically, you can think of it as what this computation would be in this if we could plug 0 in. So if you could plug 0 into here, you'd get this point, and you'd find you know that just, just the one that you want, right? You know. We just have f of x1 over 1, which is the one that we're looking for. f of x1 over 1, if we could bring delta x to 0. All right, so how would we write that out? How would we write that out? We'd have, I'm going to write it in the uh, kind of fancy lettering. We're going to have the limit as delta x goes to 0, right, of this m here. Because we're looking at this function, what does what point can this function not tell us about? You know, it's it's like someone, um, you know, you, someone has some kind of secret, and they're willing to tell you about all this other stuff. You know, but there's this one thing that they're not telling you, and because they can tell you all this other stuff, it becomes really obvious what the thing that they're not telling you is. <laughs> you can kind of think of it that way. So the limit as this delta x goes to zero of What's our m? What's our function here? f of x1, or I'm just going to call this x, actually, just because you know the 1 isn't really important because we don't have any x2s. I mean, it was important to kind of visualize before, but now it's not. f of x plus delta x minus f of x, just some point x, any point x, divided by delta x. So what we're saying here, again, is basically, we can't just sum up the, you know, the average of all of these slopes and just you know, point at one and say, oh, we know the slope there. We have to use this formula to represent the average of those slopes. And so we can use this formula to kind of cheat and look at if you just have one that you're averaging. So you just have this one that you're trying to find. And this formula will say, no, I can't tell you that. But it can tell you, it can tell you the answers for all of the other ones. And there's this smooth curve where the y value, where the slope at that one point, sh looks like it should be, but it isn't, just because of the limitations of this model. Essentially, what this is is if we just found this, if we just found the slope at that one point, and this is represented by this, right? What you know, what the y is getting close to as our delta x gets closer and closer to zero. And that is why the formula for finding the instantaneous rate of change, and we write f prime of x, which we're also going to be calling the derivative. So derivative is f prime of x is going to be the limit as that delta x goes to zero of our function, whatever function we're dealing with, of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x.
This is why, essentially, we're taking our formula for averaging all of those, you know, little um, directions up that we agreed upon existed, and then we're cheating it so that we're finding an average of just one term by using a limit and looking at this kind of graph. Thanks for watching. I hope this was a lot clearer. Uh, again, if you're comfortable with the um, explanation in the other video where we're talking about more of a quotient and kind of things more in maybe geometric or algebraic terms, uh, that's cool. But just for me personally, this was a much more helpful uh, thought process for rationalizing uh, the derivative, as I'm going to call it from now on. And I'm going to refer to it as f prime of x, and I believe we said uh, dy dx in a previous video as well. Uh, that's That comes from the idea of the quotients. Um, and so thanks for watching.